Dr. Furman graduated from UCLA with degrees in psychobiology and business administration before pursuing his uh, doctorate in physical therapy at Southern Cal. Look around the room. Look, look around. Look around the room. Okay. Now, as a result of that fall, as a keep your hands up. As a result of that fall, how many of you or how many of your friends or relatives experienced a hospitalization as a result of that fall? Okay. Far fewer. Thank goodness. It's wonderful. So, before I begin the talk, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, people talk all the time about fall prevention. Okay, and as you saw there by that first show of hands, fall prevention is really kind of a fallacy. We're all going to fall at some point. I do. You know, I was just skiing with my family a few weeks ago and I had some nasty falls. Terrible. Not a great skier. Um, we fall when it's icy outside. We fall when we're tired. We fall on the loose rugs in the house. We fall because our dog trips us with the leash. We just, it just happens sometimes. But there are things that we can do to improve our health, our balance, our awareness, and all of our systems that help contribute to us being able to have better balance. So the, the, um, the first definition on there uh, about what is balance, that's my definition. I, I did most of this from the top of my head today except for the statistical parts, which we'll get into. But it's just a network of systems that talk to each other within our bodies. It's a systems-based approach to being able to keep us upright and keep us steady. And as we know, many of us have had an experience where we feel unsteady. We don't feel like we're well-centered or well-balanced. Um, who, who uses Dr. Google from time to time in here? OK, yeah, we all, we all do. Um, so Google defines balance as the ability to distribute your weight in a way that lets you stand or move without falling or recover if you trip. Good balance requires the coordination of several parts of the body your nervous system, your inner ear, your eyes, your muscles, your bones, and your joints. And that's a very thorough definition. So what systems actually control our balance? Okay. Any guesses? You just shout it out. Inner ear. Inner ear. Yes. Eyes. Yes. Brain. Yes. Central nervous system. Perfect. The, the last one is tough. One more time. Feet, yes, okay. And, and I'll go one step further with that. As the handout shows, the visual system, the vestibular system, or the inner ear, and our proprioceptive system, our ability to feel or sense. So when's the last time anyone in here had an eye exam? Recent, within the last year? They all had an eye exam within the last year? Okay, so that's great. You're taking care of one of the major systems that helps control and contribute and maintain your balance. How many people in the room have ever had what they call Virgo? The bad word. Yes, yeah, it's awful, isn't it? Everything's spinning around, you feel sick, you feel nauseated, you, you swear you were about to die. It's terrible. Well, that's your inner ear. Um, and let's see, Janet, could I have you come up and volunteer? <laughs> That'd be all right. Give Janet a hand. Okay, Janet. So in clinic, treating people that have complaints of balance deficits, we want to know why they have balance deficits. And we want to look at all three of those systems, their vision, their muscle strength, 
their proprioceptive system, their ability to feel and sense, and their inner ear, their vestibular system. Do you have any? Oh boy, I stepped away from the microphone. I'm going to have to shout, or Bob's going to give me a microphone. Thank you, Bob. No, that's can okay. I take my shoes off? You can Here take your go. shoes off. Yes. Is that better? Thanks, Bob. Wonderful. This will just be quick, Janet, not to worry. Take, take the other one off. Let's have an equal. God forbid. Beautiful. Okay. So now Janet is barefoot and the, the playing field is level. Okay. So if you look out there among your peers, do you feel it all off balance? Yes. You do. Okay. Now, that begs the question, why? How come? Okay. We need to know why. So we're going to do a brief exam, and this is what we do in clinic, and this is something that you guys can largely figure out on your own. It's not rocket science. I'm a physical therapist. Okay. I love people, and this is what we're going to do on exam for Janet. Okay. So when you say you don't feel real steady, what's going on? Is it because I'm vibrating the floor under your feet? No, I don't know. You don't know? Okay. Well, you told me. We, yes, I did. You're right. Don't tell them. Keep okay. it. Okay. So in this position, everybody take a look at Janet and just note how she's standing. Close your eyes, please. I'm right here, so don't worry. You see what happens when Janet closes her eyes? What happens? You see her start to sway a little bit and move? Now open your eyes. And she steadies right up. Okay. How come? Because her visual frame of reference relative to the horizon disappeared. She had one less system for reference about where she is in space. And it's extremely difficult. It's hard without your eyes. So your eyes are your first line of defense. Cataracts are a thing. You know, degeneration is a thing. Um, yeah, they're hard. If, if you're not managing those things well, you're going to have significant impact to your balance. So if you're not seeing an, an ophthalmologist, an optometrist on a regular basis to, to help those things, please do. Okay, it will, it will do wonders for your balance system, okay? Um, next, okay, go ahead and widen your feet just a little bit. Okay, now in this position, I just want you to turn your head left and turn your head right, and turn your head left and turn your head right. Keep going. Move your head back and forth. Feel unsteady? I don't know. Very good. Okay, so now I want you to close your eyes and do that exact same thing, okay? Turn your head left, turn your head right. Keep your eyes shut. Keep going. Just your head. So now what we're doing, we've took her eyes away from her, and now we're moving around the fluid in her inner ear. Yeah, she's woozy. <laughs> okay, so we took two systems away, and it becomes exponentially more difficult now. So Direction change when we're walking is typically when we experience a fall. And what does that mean? It means you're walking along and everything's fine and you hear somebody shout your name from behind you and over your shoulder and as you're walking this way, you turn your head that way. And it really, really plays with your balance because your visual frame of reference changes and the fluid, the endolymph in your inner ear, and this is a model of what that little thing looks like in your inner ear. This tells you angular acceleration. Okay, am I moving forward, am I moving to my right, am I moving to my left, or am I moving backwards or forwards? And when they talk about vertigo, it has a lot to do with this system, okay? That system is constantly sending signal to our brain about where we are in space and how we steady ourselves. And I'll talk in a minute about why that system declines, okay? So the last thing we're gonna do, Janet, I promise, last one, I promise. Thank you for being such a good sport. This is a giant sponge, okay, that's all that is. And what we're going to do, we're going to bring Janet up onto the big giant sponge, okay? One foot, just stagger your feet like you're walking, mid-step, mid-step, like you're, like you're taking a normal step. There you go, perfect. Now steady yourself and see if you can balance there. You see how hard that is for her? Okay, so that's proprioception, that's her ability to feel the ground appropriately. But now that the ground is a little bit soft, Okay, like maybe soft dirt after a rain, or maybe walking in the backyard inside the wood chips. Yeah, come on down. It's very, very unnerving. I know. That's okay. I'll keep gripping it. Everybody give Janet a round of applause. Thank you very much. You did great. Careful. Thank you. I didn't know that. Okay. 
So, any questions up to this point? There's going to be plenty of time afterward. Good. And I'll, I'll step away from the big mic, Bob, since you mic'd me up mobily here. Okay. So, <clears throat> the visual system, the vestibular system, and the proprioceptive system, our feet. Um, you don't, you don't, don't share this because it's private information, but diabetes, and some people in this room might have diabetes, some people in this room might have something or have been diagnosed with something called peripheral neuropathy, um, spinal stenosis, ringing any bells for anybody? Okay, all of those things affect our ability to feel the ground and exactly what nuances are underneath our feet. And if any of those things are taking from us, and they do as we get older, I'm getting older too. 50's around the corner for me, okay? Um, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Tomatoes! Ah! I know. I knew that was coming. I did that on purpose. Yeah, Bob's playing his little violin for me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Bob. I love you. <laughs> so why does, why does balance become more challenging as we age? Well, very simple. Things like cataracts, things like macular degeneration, they, take, they impair our vision, which, as we just saw, impairs our balance, okay? Our nerve function slows the ability to sense very rapidly a change in what's happening at the ground level without looking. That, that immediate reaction, for example, if your ankle starts to turn and you can correct it in a pinch, that speed of conduction begins to decline a little bit particularly if you've got really terrible arthritis in your spine and some of those nerve roots and the sensory system with the uphill information coming to our brain, it's slowed a little bit. That's all, okay? And then lastly, our good old vestibular system, our inner ear, okay? What goes on with this thing? Well, there's fluid in these little canals, okay? It's called endolymph. Think of uh, syrup, okay? It's thick, it's viscous, like oil. And inside, and here you can start passing that around, you'd like, there are these little crystals, otoconia crystals, that move around in that fluid, okay? And when those little crystals hit cilia or hair, that little change in the position of those hair tells our brain what direction we're moving. Well, here's the problem. As we get older, we lose those cilia. They start to decline in number, okay? So we don't have as many of those little transducers telling us, are we going right? Are we going left? Are we going forward? Are we going backward? So it becomes more difficult to know where we are. Um, Thad, this is the part when I mentioned to you earlier when we were talking privately, I hope I don't depress anybody. Um, I've got some epidemiological information here and the only reason, I really want to put this out there as a disclaimer, the only reason I want to share this is to motivate every single one of you in this room to start today working on yourselves. It is not too late. You are not too old. I hate that word, by the way, okay? And, and you can absolutely make a difference. You don't think you can because, oh my gosh, what is standing up and down 30 times gonna do for me? I'll tell you what it's gonna do for you if you can do it without using your arms and your hands and pushing off the chair or doing what we call in clinic a, a, a gower sign, having to climb up the front of you. You'll live about five years longer, okay? All the epidemiological studies and all the research or what we call meta-analysis prove this. If you can get up from a chair without using your arms, you will live longer and you will live more healthfully, okay? But if you have to push, if you have to grab, if you have to pull, if you have to reach for somebody's hand, you're actually on a decline physically and your morbidity and mortality are actually facing you. So it's very simple. Now, 28% of adults, we, we did the show of hands at the very beginning, 28% of adults over age 65 report falling each year, resulting in 3 million emergency department visits and 800,000 annual hospitalizations in the U.S. alone. I happen to think that that's low because this is just what's reported. How many of you have fallen and, like, I've done this, I've fallen and not told anybody because I was like, <laughs> I don't want anybody to know I just bit the dust. People fall all the time and don't say a word to anybody. So I think that these numbers that are published in our literature are not quite what they really are. Um, not all falls hurt us. Some of us fall and we get right back up and we go, oh, doggone it, and we dust ourselves off. But about 37% of all falls result in a pretty significant injury, like a head injury, a hip fracture, a wrist fracture, torn rotator cuff muscles in the shoulder because you know, reflexively we put out our arms when we go down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
This is the part that I, I would like to impress upon everybody here. If you have a fall, and, and regardless of whether or not you go to the hospital for it or not, okay, there's typically about a one-third chance, one in three people that experience a fall, is going to have a functional decline after the fall. Okay? Who wants to have a functional decline? Not me. Not anybody in this room, right? You want to keep everything you've got for as long as you can. And that's normal. That's human. And that's exactly what we want for everybody as physical therapists. We want to see people do well. You know, physically, it's very important. This is the one vessel that we actually do have some pretty solid control over with a little bit of work. Um, and then this one hits me hard. Um, my grandmother, Miriam, she was 86. She was my dad's mom many, many years ago. Um, perfectly healthy woman. She cooked for like 30 of us in the family, you know, a couple weeks prior to her demise. Um, she took out her little, I call them toy dogs. You know those little dogs are like this big. She took her little doggy out for a walk on the sidewalk and the darn thing ran itself around her ankles with a leash. And she did one of those, you know, timber like a tree, broken hip, broken pelvis. Three months, she was dead. It, it is absolutely preventable. And what would have been preventable in her case was, don't take that little dog out walking on the concrete with a leash for God's sake. You know, and if you do, go with somebody. You know, these are things to think about because these things happen. In clinic, uh, as a rehabilitation professional, the most damaging result that we see after falls, of course, and you guys have it there in front of you, 300,000 hip fractures per year in the United States. 300,000. Of those, and we're just talking about hip fractures, only hip fractures, just 20% of them enter long-term care facilities within the first year. And one-third of them, again, 33% of them approximately, die within the first year after a hip fracture. It gives me no pleasure to report this information, by the way. Like, I can't stand this stuff, but this is just what the facts are. Um, <clears throat> all right, what are the major risk factors? You're already thinking about them. I know some of you are tinkering up here right now going, okay, how can I not be one of those statistics? Yeah, nobody wants to be. Oh, <laughs> Don't climb on a ladder, that's perfect. One of, the, one of the times that I, in my life, I still remember it like it was yesterday. My grandfather has passed, uh, he, he got to 96. This is my mother's father. I've never in my life seen my mother go after her father like I saw this day. We drove up to San Jose, pulled up to 1677 Patio Drive where my grandparents were my whole life, and my grandfather at about 83, 84 was on the roof. <laughs> coveralls with a, a lean-to ladder, and he was repairing shingles up there with a hammer. And, and my, my mother down here just lost her mind. Um, anyway, sorry about that. I still remember it right here. Okay, so risk factors. Muscle weakness. If you're weak, you have a 1.5 to 3 times higher risk of suffering a fall. So strength has a lot to do with not being a victim of gravity, okay? Poor balance. Again, 1.5 to 3 times higher risk of having a fall if your balance is poor. And what do I mean by poor balance? <clears throat> In clinic, if we were to test you, we take away your ankle stability, and you can still stand there and be relatively steady. Or we take away your ankle stability, and you start to do this, and reach and grab and you know, tear off the sleeves of our shirts because you think you're going to hit the deck. That is a huge risk factor. Okay? But there are absolutely things that you can do about it. And then the last one, well, not the last one, but one of the ones that the literature talks about a lot, slow walking speed. I'm not sure if you guys pay attention to this much or not. How fast you walk compared to your peers has a lot to do with whether or not you're at risk. 60% um, of the time during a normal gait cycle, 60% of the time during a normal gait cycle, you're on one foot. How many of you ever practice standing on one foot? I love that. Look at that. Some people. Beautiful. So if you're spending 60% of the time when you walk on one foot, why wouldn't you try to practice on occasion being on one foot? Okay? So 45% of all falls occur while we're walking, and slower walking speed of those ages 75 and up is, is, is a very good indicator that you're at higher risk for falls. 
falling in here. Um, the, the speed is not necessarily important, but this is just, again, what the literature says. 0.7 meters per second versus 1 meter per second. If you're slower than 0.7 or you're faster than 0.1, you're either uh, uh, at higher or lower risk of having a fall. Um, again, we already touched on visual impairments. How many people in this room, by a show of hands, if you don't want to raise your hand, I totally get it, because I'm absolutely out of line, and I'm violating HIPAA, and as a medical professional, it's terrible. But, but how many people take medication? Of any kind? Okay, en enough said. So anybody who's on blood pressure medication, that's, we're gonna just use that one as an example, or any other medication that indirectly affects your blood pressure may be at higher risk for falling particularly if you're on multiple medications. That all do something a little bit different. Because you're taking medication to support or, or to help with one system, but that medication might have a, an effect on a different system. And, wow, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Great hat. Where was it? Did you take his hat off? There he is. We were just having a conversation, and I explained something called orthostatic hypotension. When I'm lying flat, my blood is being pumped this way from my heart to my head. It doesn't have to compete with gravity. My pressure is relatively low. So I sit up in bed real fast because I heard a lot of noise in the middle of the night or glass breaking. I'm going to be a little woozy for a second. Why? Because it takes a, a little while for my heart to create more pressure to start pushing that blood uphill toward my head. Or if I've been sitting down at a long movie or at a Christmas dinner, enjoying time with my family, feeding myself, and all my blood is in my gut helping to digest my food, and I stand up real quick because I gotta pee, I might, I might have a second where, whew, because your pressure needs to catch up with the change in your position. It's very simple and it happens to all of us, myself included. The last time I remember it happening, um, I was bending over for a long, long time, organizing tools in my toolbox in the garage, I should have just sat down or knelt down, but I was doing it like this, like a moron. And I was down here for a long time. And I stood up real quick, and I went, holy mackerel. My pressure, it didn't catch up, because my head was down for a long time, and now my head is upright. So these are things to pay attention to that can dramatically impact the balance. Anybody ever experienced that sort of thing? John? Yeah, a little dizzy, sure, we all have, exactly. John? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the humor. Sure. Uh, yeah. Another another risk factor is environment. Um, my my dad is from Iran, and uh, probably the most valuable thing in in our entire family are you know silk Persian area rugs from four, five, six generations that have been handed down through the family. Um, and, and I had a real hard, long talk with my folks ages ago to roll up some of those things and take them off the floor because my mom, who is a rheumatoid arthritic, um, was really suffering with debilitating knee pain prior to her knee replacement, and she fell in the house a couple times because she, you know, caught the toe on the edge of the rug. So in the environment, you guys, take a look and take stock of everything around you and get rid of anything that poses a significant risk to you or to your loved ones at home. Um, how many people fear fall? Come on, be honest. I'm terrified of falling. I don't want to fall. Okay, that fear will oftentimes prevent you or keep you from doing exactly what is necessary to help you prevent having a fall. You don't want to be active because, well, what if I fall? Well, go see a physical therapist. Get a personal trainer. Hang on to your kitchen counter or to a grab bar on the wall while you do a little bit of exercise. Take the fear out of the equation so that you can actually get moving and do the things that you actually need to do so that you don't become one of these statistics. That's really important. If nobody wants to fall, nobody, okay? And if that's preventing you from working at it a little bit, stop it and do it whatever you have to do to make it safe and if that means come see a professional like me, fine. If it doesn't, figure it out. You know, have one of your grandkids stand there next to you, you know, and make sure that you're steady. Something, anything. Um, what can we do about it? And this is really the meat of, of what I want to talk about today. Um, who believes that exercise is medicine? Movement is medicine. Okay. In, in all six of our clinics, up on the wall, we have a sign that says movement is medicine. 
Okay? It really is. You know, some of us tease and call it joint juice, and some of us say, you know, it's, it's the magic elixir, it's the fountain of youth. It's, it's really the one thing that we can all do to whatever capacity that we're able. And, and I like to do this, and, and some of you in this room have been patients of mine, I won't call you out, but um, I like to do something like this in clinic. When somebody, a, a patient is really struggling or complaining, oh, I don't want to do another one, John, don't make me do another one, please. Um, or don't stretch me that far, it hurts too bad, etc., etc. I tell them this, I say, look, the threshold for all of us is different. How do you change your threshold? Okay? You, you smack it, you hit it. You go up to it, and you hit it again. And then, you know, a day, two days later, after you've rested, you hit it again. And what happens over time, it doesn't happen overnight, your threshold increases. Your capacity increases. Your strength increases. Your mobility increases. And your fear, as a result, decreases because you actually become more feeble. And that is possible at any age. Any age. So what kind of exercise is um, by a show of hands, and I know this is the active seniors, so it's going to be a lot. How many of you exercise? And it could be anything. Walking, yoga, water aerobics, stretching, riding a stationary bicycle, walking with your, your friends, it's anything. Okay, beautiful. I love it. A good, healthy balance is aerobic, strength, and balance. So aerobic is things like walking. Uh, things like riding a stationary bicycle. Things like using a, a, a little stepper machine. Um, Anything like that, walking, etc., etc. Strength training is resistance training. Well, 9.8 meters per square is gravity, okay? And for a lot of people in this room, that is plenty. So, how many of you, with a, a with just by a show of hands, in a chair without arms, without arms, would be able to stand without using your hands? A fair number of you. Yes, great. Okay, so for those of you who didn't raise your hands, a very simple but effective, worthwhile, life-extending exercise would be simply to sit in a chair at home, any chair, okay, preferably one that's got a wall behind it so that it doesn't go over backwards this way. Just practice standing up without using your hands. And if you have to, stack a couple of phone books under your rear end. You know, whatever you've got, cardboard boxes, so you don't drop down so far that you can't get up. Okay, find something. Okay, and if you have to do this initially, tell yourself you're only going to allow yourself to do that five times. Or maybe you put it in front of the kitchen counter and you use just one finger, or you go from all five fingers to three fingers to two fingers to one finger to no hands. Okay, there are so many simple ways to progress yourself with exercise that literally will extend how long you are able to live and remain independent. And it's just a little bit of work. Um, on the balance side of things, we talked a little bit about the one foot. How many people are in the kitchen sometimes during the day? <laughs> we all are, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, how, many, how many by a show of hands in the room have, um, I, I installed them for my parents when my mom went to her knee replacement, but you know, the, the grab bars either this way or that way on the wall in the, in the bathroom, in the shower, near the tub. Those things aren't coming out of the two by four stud. Get a good grip on that thing and practice. Okay? Take the fear out of the equation. And if you're still scared, go to a PT clinic. Okay? And have somebody like me put you through a regimen okay? of work that is specific to you because it will act absolutely change the quality of your life. Um, Typically, when discharge, or we call it graduation, is approaching for a patient in clinic, everybody wants to know, well, how am I going to do this on my own? What am I going to do when I'm done? I'm going to decline again. I don't have a place to exercise. In our practice, we say, no, oh, yeah, you can come here. Come to the practice and exercise. You don't be a patient anymore. You're going to do what we call transitional training. You just come in and exercise. We're going to remove your excuse. So I don't have a place to exercise, okay? Because it means that much to us. We want you to see, we want to see you continue to do well. But if you want to do it on your own, Way down at the bottom of that second page. This is a guideline, but it's certainly not uh, set in stone. And it's going to vary for everybody. Everybody. But approximately 30 minutes a day, five days a week, moderate intensity. What does that even mean? Okay. <clears throat> well, five days a week is pretty simple. Okay. 30 minutes a day is pretty simple. What's moderate intensity? Moderate intensity for that means that if you and I are at the gym and we're on adjacent stationary bicycles, <laughs> 
Can you dad talk to me? Dad, you're pushing a little too hard, my man. Dial it back. Okay? We should be able to talk. Okay? That's moderate. Okay? If, if you're not attached a little bit, it's way too easy and it's not going to change you. And, and I know it's cliche and I know some of you are probably like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. It's got to challenge you a little bit. Janet, may I ask you a question? Sure. Was it a little bit scary when you were on the big sponge and I had you stagger step like that? Were you a little bit leery of? I was afraid of making a fool of myself. <laughs> no, no, that's my job today. That's what I'm doing. So, what, what my point in saying that is, it's got to be challenging. That's a little bit challenging. Okay? And if you work at that, what would be remarkable for you, for example, to experience is you know, twice a week for an hour, you know, coming for treatment or on your own every day for 20 or 30 minutes practicing something like that with your hands floating right over the top of your kitchen counter. In about six weeks' time, you'd be able to stand on that thing just like this, like a statue, and you wouldn't move. And you'd be much more steady and stable and confident on your feet. So those kinds of changes are possible at any age. Thank you. I'm leaving 10 minutes uh, for questions or answers. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come here today and, and share a little bit. Yes. Do you have an outreach program for in-home therapy? We should. No, we don't. You need to send therapists out to your home? Yes. No, but you know what? You just gave me an idea to start another company. <laughs> and, I, and I probably should do that because there, there is such a tremendous need for that, and there's just not enough coverage. And just like our, our whole healthcare system right now is just so... So fucked up. I mean, you call your doctor, you get an appointment, when you wait for four months, five months. Do you have a recommendation of how to get in-home? So, <clears throat> yes. Uh, VNA has a, a, a program. Um, let me think of the other. Little blue and white cars. Um, what are they called? What are they called? Heart on hand? Isn't it like heart and hands or something? I'll, I'll make up a list for you. We have a, a printed list at the clinic, but I can't recall the names. There are only about three of them locally, though. Um, one of the things that we talked about at this week's leadership meeting was to get a small little fleet of uh, vans to actually go pick up patients in their homes and bring them to the clinic, because a lot of people have trouble with transportation. They want to come to the clinic, they just can't get to us. And, and we were thinking about, well, how can we get patients here or, or you know, go to their home, bring them here, but that's actually a better idea. Let me go to you. Yes? John, you talk about how to prevent falling. How do you fall? How do you Should fall? Should you fall? If you're going to fall. A, that's a great question. So if um, I use this example in clinic a lot when I'm talking to, to spinal patients that are worried about their middle back. Um, there are reflexes in us that are extraordinarily hard to overcome. Okay? And if, if I were, for example, if I didn't see this ledge and I were walking and not paying attention and I started to feel myself fall down to the floor, I would reflexively push my arms and my hands out. And it's so hard to override that innate reflexive response. That's why we end up with all these fractures at the distal radius. That's why we end up with rotator cuff tears at our shoulders, um, et cetera, et cetera. But to answer your question directly, it's always best not to land on the bony prominence. And in English, what that means is if I'm going to fall onto the concrete, do I want that to be the first thing that hits the concrete? No, I do not. <laughs> Soft tissue, the great big outside of your shoulder, your shoulder blade, okay, your rear end, your, your upper back, which is a huge area. And in fact, um, this may sound silly to some of you, but the thoracic spine, which is <clears throat> from T1 here down to T12 here. So that middle portion of our back, not our neck, not our low back, but the mid portion, that is the strongest section of your spine. And, and if you think about evolution, when this used to be a quadruped organism before it was a bipedal organism, these guys are protection, okay? And you can fall on a flight of stairs, for example, and smack your spine right there in the middle portion of your back. And you might break a vertebrae, you might snap one of these spinous processes, but the likelihood that you're gonna have a debilitating, terrible injury is very small. Um, 
whenever we're teaching manipulation techniques to, to our residents or to new graduates when we're talking about how to do high velocity low amplitude manipulation in that section of the spine and they're afraid, the students are afraid, I always will tell them, listen, you can take a baseball bat and you can hit me across my upper back. Nothing's going to happen to me. That section of your spine is extremely strong. The only problem with falling in that direction is the back of your head. So at all costs, protect your head. Okay? If, if, if you can avoid hitting your head, it's a blessing. You know, I would much rather take a, a shot with this floor to a portion of my body, any portion of my body, other than my head. Okay? This is the supercomputer that controls everything else. So protect your head. Thanks, that's a great question. Anybody else? Yes? I'd like yes. to... Uh, I don't know. Yes, you do. Uh, I'd Not like to problem. ask you about the water. You haven't covered us that live in the water. It's a fantastic question. So the, the Montage Wellness Center, both in, in North Salinas as well as the facility out in Marina, they've got really nice heated indoor pools. Um, it's an unweighting environment and it's warm, which means you're a little bit more mobile, okay? You feel like you're uh, in Palm Springs or in San Diego, it feels better on your joints, and you're not weighting your system as much. So for people that are very deconditioned, it's a great place to start, but if you're able to walk independently, and you're able to move around independently, and live independently, I don't know how much a water therapy program would challenge you. But if you're unable to do what we call a dry land program, then that's a fantastic place to start. And there's virtually no way to hurt yourself in full water. If you fall in water, big deal. You, you're going to get your hair wet. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> okay? But um, it's a good, safe place to start, but it may not be challenging enough for some people. That's all. But it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful question. Yes, in the back here. Seek out some help to get on a professional strength training program or a mobility program that will help you when you go out there and challenge yourself on the trails. Thank you for sharing that. Yes? I wondered if you recommend those walking sticks that people with like Absolutely. So I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I have had, so I've been a, a clinician for about 24 years now, and one of the, the recurring um, I don't want to call it an argument, but one of the recurring conversations that I have lovingly with many patients is, for God's sake, use your walker, or for God's sake, why didn't you have your cane, you know, or why didn't you take your walking system? Most people see them, thank you, Dad, most people see them as a, as a, I don't know, 
I'm, I'm old now and I need this cane, or I have to rely on this thing. Well, how many of you walked here today from your house? I mean, we can rely on all sorts of devices, don't we? How many of you have a hearing aid so you can hear? Yeah. How many of you are wearing shoes to protect your feet? Okay. Come on. It's, it's nothing other than an enabling device to allow you to continue to do what you want to do and to be active the way that you want to be active and to go and do the things that you want to do. It means nothing. Absolutely nothing. But for whatever reason, there's this huge stigma about it. We even offer it to our patients sometimes, hey, we'll spray paint it for you. What color do you want? <laughs> you know, we'll wrap it in, in Coban, any color you want, just so it's a little cooler to look at. Um, anything that allows you to continue to stay mobile, stay active, and stay safe is worth using. I don't care what it looks like. Because the alternative is continued functional decline. Because you're scared, because you had a history of a bad fall, because you're weak, or because you know, you've got a little slope that, that leads you out down from the front of your house, whatever it might be. Anything. Walking sticks I love because they're so light. They're, they're feather light, and they're adjustable. You can adjust them just about any way that you want. They've got all kinds of cool, funny grips that you can get for them. You can um, change the, the tips on the bottom, depending on the terrain that you're walking in. Um, so I really am a fan, particularly if you're out on a hike. Because it's just like, it's, it's almost like having four legs instead of just two. And uh, um, the reason that they work, if we're going to get you know, into physics, is just base of support, or what we uh, document as BOS, base of support. It widens your base. Okay, so if I've got two sticks out here and I've got my two legs here, now effectively I've got this massive base of support underneath me. And if I'm spread out in a step stance but I still have my walking sticks, I've got a huge base of support underneath me because of those two points of balance. So that's why they work. There's, there's nothing magical about them. It's just physics. They, they literally give you this huge, wide base underneath you. Yes? John, the other benefit of those walking sticks is that if you walk without them, uh, the city sidewalks are so messed up these oh, days. You're right. Trip. And when you walk with walking stick, if you don't have to be like this looking at the ground all the time, you literally can look up, which affects your ears and your eyes. So you Beautiful. can look upright. You're upright with your spine and everything else. You want a part-time job? <laughs> I love that. He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. That's fantastic. Um, again, visual frame of reference and, and the vestibular system. The end of the ears. It's perfect. John. Yes. Is it best to help your feet balance? To go without shoes? I would say a resounding no. Um, Do you want me to repeat that? Could you hear me back there? No. I asked whether it was good to go barefooted rather than having shoes. I, I would say no for a couple of reasons. Um, one, a, a shoe gives you a little bit more exterior stability because feet, in general, they're narrow. Okay, not for everyone. They're, I've never seen two uh, uh, pair of feet that are identical. In, 20 years of practice, but a shoe, one, is going to protect your skin. Two, it's going to give you a slightly wider base. And most shoes are a little bit more rigid than our feet. So they give you added stability. And somebody over here was whispering about diabetes. Um, and, and exactly, if you have any diabetic peripheral neuropathy and you don't feel well, you don't sense well, um, I'll go to a story of a, of a patient because it just haunts me to this day. Um, local gentleman. Uh, it was, it was a winter afternoon, and he had built a fire in his fireplace, and he had his jammies on and no shoes on, and he fell asleep on the couch, and his feet were toward the fireplace, and he was a diabetic, and it resulted in one amputation, and it resulted in like four or five skin graft operations on the other foot, because he completely burned the skin from the bottom of his feet while he slept, and he didn't even know what happened. So, devastating, because he couldn't feel and that's what happens if you've got real severe neuropathy. And that's why it's so important to go and see people and make sure whether or not you're afflicted with this stuff. Because oftentimes you don't even know. You don't know. You know, um, we've got um, monofilament testing kits, for example, in the clinic, or these little, we call them sharp doll pinwheels. You guys have probably seen them uh, over the years. And <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll just have patients close their eyes, and we'll hit them with this really sharp, sharp end, and then we'll hit them with the dull end. And we'll just ask, with your eyes shut, sharp or dull? 
chirp the gall, chirp the gall. Now, but I want that answer right now because if you can sense well, you should be able to tell me immediately whether I poked you hard with that sharp end or whether I just bumped you with the dull end. And we get people all the time. Uh, 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 uh. Or the answer they give is wrong. And and then we tell them, hey, you know what? I hit you every single time with a sharp. And, and then I'll, I'll take a fingertip and I'll poke them on the owl. You didn't feel that in your feet at all. And then just look at me with a confused look in their face. They have very severe problems feeling the ground underneath them. And of course that's going to put them at higher risk to have a fall. So I like footwear. Sorry for the long-winded answer. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, so let us... I got it. Put your mouth right up next to it. So let us montage. Um, they told me that for my balance, I should like suck my stomach in, you know, stand up straight. For my balance, I suck my stomach in. They, they may have been trying to get you to activate a, a muscle called transversus abdominis. Um, that's, that's all I can think of. Um, or, or they were just trying to get you to be up here rather than down here, perhaps. Because our head, generally, weighs about 8 to 14 pounds. Okay? And we teach patients all the time that we have good rapport with. You know, if you've got a PhD, you're just probably a little heavier. But, <laughs> but where, where your head goes, your body typically will follow. And that's why it's so important, to your point, keeping your head upright, walking sticks, etc. Because if you're here, your center of mass is going to follow where your head goes. And, and oftentimes what we'll see if, if you know, your, your forward momentum and your progression is going in this direction, and you hear a loud noise over there someplace and you're walking, immediately that's what will happen to you, simply because of the change in direction of your head while you're moving in a, in a, a different direction. It's very difficult. But these are things that you can train and that you can work on. Thank you. It's a great question. Of course. Thank you again, all of you, so much. Yes, one more back here. A few years ago, I had a slip and fall, and I had uh, just been shopping and had bags in both hands, and then I fell on my shoulder, and uh, I ended up with an AC separation. Uh, if you could please explain. Sure. AC, AC stands for a chromioclavicular, okay? And the clavicular por portion, sorry, it's the microphone. The, the clavicular portion is the clavicle, and the acromial portion is your shoulder blade, okay? So where your shoulder blade comes together with the end of your clavicle, right here, is called the AC joint. And that joint is actually only held together by three tiny little ligaments, and you can, you can dislocate it by hitting your shoulder against the wall like this. And if, if uh, this is actually something that probably a lot of you will, will um, resonate with, um, NBA basketball players, if you look at them real closely, they're all, most of them are out there in tank tops. And they've got this great, big, ugly, knobby looking thing out here, out here. A lot of them, even though they're these great, big, strong, muscular, professional athletes, have separated AC joints. And when that happens, the end of their clavicle pops right up. And, and it's because for years, they've been out there, you know, bang against those players like this. And it separates that joint. It just pops those little ligaments loose. So it's not a fracture. You didn't break a bone. You tore some little itty bitty ligaments here that contribute to the stability of that joint. What, what's the matter with an AC joint separation is that because your clavicle has to spin backwards when you elevate your arm, it makes overhead reaching a little bit difficult, and it makes crossbody reaching a little bit difficult. But otherwise, it's really benign. It hurts, no doubt, but it's not something that needs surgical attention or anything like that. Sure. Yes. Could you demonstrate quickly? I know we're done, but could you show us how to properly lift something? Something heavy. Sure. Absolutely. Let's see. Let's lift something heavy. Here, I'll just use this chair. Sure. So the strongest muscles in the body, believe it or not, are not the quadriceps muscles. They're the hip extensors. They're the, they're the ones that kick back like this, okay? The great big rear end muscles, your hamstring, the muscles that drive you up a flight of stairs, or the muscles that drive you up a steady incline. We, in, in, in clinic, generically, we call it the posterior chain muscles, okay? Those are the most powerful muscles, and they're large, and they're thick, 
in your body. So that's what you want to use to lift. And if this chair weighed, you know, 80, 90, 100 pounds or whatever, the first thing that you want to do is to think about the first point of leverage being your hip, not your back. Okay? So if these are the strongest, most powerful muscles in my body, how do I engage them? I move them back first. Okay? And what else does that do? It keeps my spine in an upright position. The, the position of my whole spine literally does not change from here to here. It goes that way, but the whole columnar structure stays aligned. Versus, if I come down here like this, now I'm really at risk. But if I'm going to use the powerful hip extensors, I'm going to push my hips back, my head stays up, I'm going to attach whatever it is I'm lifting to my body, and I'm going to stand straight up. Okay? The other thing to think about when you lift anything is lever arm distance. Okay? And again, I, I nerd out on this stuff, but I'll, I won't bury, <laughs> bore you with the details. So if I lift a heavy object way out there, the distance from the object to my back multiplies the force against my back a lot versus, hey, now I can talk. <laughs> this is easy because the distance between my spine and the object I'm lifting is really, really small. There's a short lever, which means there's less force on my back. Versus, if I lengthen that lever, now that whole distance from that object to my spine is multiplying the force against my back. So if you're going to lift a heavy object, keep it as close to you as possible. And again, break at your waist first. Grab the object, keep it as close to you as possible, and then stand straight up with it. Great question. Thank you. And I noticed your feet are apart. Light base. Yes. Absolutely. You got it. Good observation. Thanks.